Welcome back to another episode of Computers Are Bad on Video. My name is Jesse Crawford, and I've spent a while promising on the blog that I would talk about environmental remediation sites at Kirtland Air Force Base. So I'm going to use this video as kind of a transitional opportunity to move uh, a little bit from Cold War history towards environmental remediation. We're going to be talking about a site that is really interesting from a historical perspective and also has an aspect of environmental contamination to it. In general, I think throughout this series, we're going to be sort of using the environmental contamination as a lens through which we'll look at the Cold War history of many of these sites. I think that this video is going to end up being a two-parter. I have enough material that I think it, it might stretch towards an hour again, and I don't want to put together another hour and a half video. So I think in our first part, we'll talk about the history, and in the second part, we will talk about the environmental contamination and remediation aspects. So what are we going to be talking about? Monzano Base. This is a map of Kirtland Air Force Base, and this might look familiar to you if you watched the previous video that I posted. It's, it's sort of the same uh, geographical area. Monzano Base, labeled on this map Monzano area, is this area right here in kind of the central portion, well, really the northeast portion of uh, base proper, but the central portion of the entire DoD area. I want to point out this map is from an environmental remediation planning document. Uh, so all of those points that are marked throughout this map, those are all uh, environmental remediation sites which were active at some point. A number of these have uh, since been closed. So it gives you a little bit of a picture of the scale of the environmental remediation that's in progress at the Air Force Base. And this really isn't a complete picture only. These are only the sites which are being managed under the purview of the Department of Defense Hazardous Waste Act permit, uh, not under the Department of Energy Hazardous Waste Act permit, uh, or the Department of Energy Legacy uh, Management Program, etc. So there's actually, I would venture nearly twice as many environmental remediation sites on the base uh, as you see here. Monzano Base essentially is a small mountain on the Air Force Base, but it's a mountain that has a bit of a story behind it. The first public word of, of Monzano Bay seems to have gone out in 1947, when the Denver Post actually ran an article with the allegation that the military was constructing a secret base in a hollowed-out mountain in New Mexico. Now, there's a whole lot of rumors about underground military bases and hollowed-out mountains. Most of the time, they don't turn out to be correct. But in the case of Monzano Base, uh, the Denver Post was pretty much dead on. Uh, a hollowed out mountain is maybe a, a little over dramatic, but Monzano Base really is a formerly highly secret tunnel complex uh, dug into a, a small mountain that is just southeast of the city of Albuquerque uh, and of, of what is now, in fact, it's now in Kirtland Air Force Base. At the time, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base was much smaller than it is today. And the area off to the east where, for example, Sandia National Laboratories is located was actually Sandia Army Base and was really the locus of the nuclear weapons program, or as the Department of Defense called it, the Special Weapons Program uh, in the United States. Immediately after World War II, the United States really didn't have a stockpile to speak of. Um, there's actually a, a bit of a story of immediately after World War II, I think the president asking um, the Special Weapons Program for an accounting of the United States nuclear stockpile. And the response was something like, you know, we have parts to maybe put together two weapons. Uh, there really had not been manufacturing of nuclear weapons on any scale. Uh, they, they just weren't being stockpiled in the modern sense. Uh, of course, the Cold War changed that, and by the end of the 1940s, a pretty serious manufacturing operation was getting into swing for nuclear weapons. With the production of all those nuclear weapons, of course, came a need for someone for somewhere to store them. That, uh, that need for storage led to a program which was called Operation Water Supply. Operation Water Supply would ultimately construct uh, 13 what are called nuclear stockpile sites, or NSSs, within the United States, as well as uh, several in allied countries. Uh, 
Manzano base, which we'll be talking about, was, depending on how you look at it, either the first or second national stockpile site to be completed. Manzano base, I believe, was the earlier of the two projects in terms of when it was started, but Killeen base, which is located in Texas, was actually finished a little bit earlier than Manzano base. Depending on exactly how you count, Manzano base became active in 1950 or 1952, Total construction on the site started in the late 40s. It took about 10 years. It didn't reach full operational capability until, I believe, 1959. But they did begin use of the site before then. So Manzano Base essentially was a huge storage facility for nuclear weapons. It's a little more complex than you might expect from that description, though. And understanding that requires understanding a bit of the context of nuclear weapons at the time. Nuclear weapons in the late 1940s were very high maintenance. Uh, there's a few different reasons for that. Uh, the most obvious is that the neutron initiators, which were used, uh, were, were made of polonium, and they had a half-life of 138 days. So you can imagine they actually needed to be replaced pretty frequently in order to keep the nuclear weapons in operation. Because the neutron initiator was located at the center of the pit, that was a fairly intensive operation. It required taking the pit out of the weapon, uh, removing a plug from it, swapping out the neutron initiator, and then putting the weapon back together. In addition, the pits had a tendency to corrode, so it was necessary to clean and basically polish them on a regular basis as well, usually whenever that uh, polonium initiator was replaced. So these weren't just storage facilities for nuclear weapons. We really need to think of them as maintenance facilities as well. They included fairly substantial shop facilities, uh, which could be used for all of those maintenance and inspection operations on the weapons. While the National Stockpile Sites were designed by an engineering contractor for the Air Force Special Weapons Program and were built by the Air Force Special Weapons Program, they were actually operated by Sandia National Laboratories initially. Um, that goes for all of the sites, not just Monzano Base. Most of them, after a shakeout period, were transferred to direct operation by the Air Force Special Weapons Program, but Sandia National Laboratories remained involved in the operation of the facilities as the experts on the maintenance and assembly of nuclear weapons. Now, I will probably do a future video where I talk about the National Stockpile Sites as a larger program, so I'm going to try not to spend too much time uh, talking about the other sites, um, but I will mention that something you'll see maybe when I make that video, Monzano Base and Colleen Base, because they were the first two which were constructed, are actually quite a bit different from the others. Most of the later National Stockpile Sites are not really as interesting in their construction. They're not, you know, tunnel complexes dug into the side of mountains. But Manzano and Colleen were really kind of over-engineered, so they're, they really are quite interesting. Uh, they're probably some of the more hardened facilities which the United States has built. Uh, so what exactly is at Manzano Base? Well, number one, there's a lot of support facilities. Some of what we'll talk about were really things that were not necessarily specific to the nuclear weapons complex. Things like warehouses, uh, housing. I should explain, Manzano Base, despite being so close to Sandia Base, until the 70s was considered a separate installation. So it was sort of self-sufficient. Um, it had its own housing area. It had all of the support services for the personnel who worked there. Um, so we'll see that there's a lot of those support facilities. Well, what was located at Manzano Base that was very specific to the mission was first an extensive security complex. It's probably fairly obvious when you look at this image, uh, this very obvious border to the facility. Um, that is a cleared out area. There are four concentric layers of fences, and one of those four layers, I believe the third layer in to protect it, was an electric fence. Um, that electric fence was apparently pretty serious business. There was actually an incident in 1972 where a teenager from Albuquerque who snuck onto base um, tried to sneak into Monzano base and was actually fatally electrocuted by that electric fence. Located all around the facility, generally near the fence perimeter, are pillboxes uh, where army guards were stationed. And the only entrance to the facility is by a security gate, which was located here. 
and all accounts are that gaining access to the facility was very difficult. Monzano Base and the National uh, Stockpile Sites, more generally, are sometimes colloqu colloquially referred to as Q areas. Um, you'll see that term used back in the 1950s especially, because everyone who had access to the sites was required to hold a Q clearance. Uh, and honestly, back then, that, that really meant more than it did today. It was a very small group of people who were permitted um, entrance to these sites, and they were very heavily guarded. So the security apparatus was quite substantial, and that included extensive technical security measures, uh, including electronic intrusion detection systems, which, as you can imagine, in the 1950s were quite a bit more primitive than they are today. But there was still a lot of use of things like vibration sensors uh, in order to detect any intrusion attempt into the facility. The actual nuclear sites at Monzano Base, um, I will generally organize into three categories. Um, and I apologize that these photos are, are kind of terrible. They're the best I could find. I found them from someone's blog, and I, I'm not even sure where he got them. I wasn't able to find the report that these came out of. This is a photo of what they call a Type C bunker. Um, I would refer to this as being sort of a lower security bunker. This is the same type of construction that you generally see for ammunition storage, um, but it is a little more hardened. It has a little heavier uh, door, for example. But basically, this is a concrete structure that has kind of a, a half-cylinder uh, shape to it behind this front wall, which has then been covered in earth, which uh, gives it some protection from either an explosion that might occur in the structure um, or possibly an attack on the outside of the structure. As I understand it, these Type C bunkers were mostly used to store things uh, like uh, non-explosive and non-nuclear components of the weapons. So things that were security sensitive, uh, but were not as uh, dangerous and as important to protect as things like nuclear components. The next type of facility that you find at Monzano Base, and this is what is really, you know, something that you don't see really anywhere else, with the exception of Monzano Base, Colleen Base, and various other uh, nuclear weapon sites. For example, I believe there's something constructed very much like this in Echo Canyon at Los Alamos, uh, is the Type D bunker. And the Type D bunker um, is also referred to sometimes as a bedrock bunker. So this sort of usable section of this bunker is actually bored out from the bedrock of the mountain. What we see here is an entrance, and you can kind of see that this entrance is cut into the mountainside, but right inside that door is actually not the bunker at all. That door just opens into a tunnel, which goes quite a bit deeper into the mountain. And then at the end of that tunnel, there is a, a vault door, which is what allows you access to the actual bunker. These had something like 15 to 30 meters of bedrock above the actual bunker, which was intended to provide uh, protection against a limited direct nuclear strike on the facility. Next, and perhaps the most interesting thing uh, that we find at Monzano Base, are the shops. Uh, Monzano Base would ultimately have four shops built. These are where that maintenance and refurbishment work was done on nuclear weapons. But the first two to be built, which were called Plant 1 and Plant 2, were entirely underground, and they consisted of tunnels bored back into the mountain. Uh, this is a photo of the entrance to one of those, but it's a little more interesting to take a look. Uh, this is a, a contemporary um, photograph of the entrance to one of, those bunk uh, one of those plants. You can see there are a couple of road entrances. I believe that is one and that is one. But more interestingly, if you look uphill, um, these are actually air vent structures, which were used for ventilation for the facility. It went quite a ways in. Um, I was fortunately actually able to find a general floor plan of one of these plants. Um, this is plant number one, so it's actually the same one that we were just looking at. Uh, and you can see that there is a set of kind of workshop and storage spaces, which branch off of tunnels uh, all around these parts. And then off to the side, kind of coming off at an angle, I'm not totally sure why this angle, but it, it seems to have been pretty typical of the design, is kind of a very particular section uh, of this plant. Um, that's something that would later be referred to as the A structure. I'll probably explain that a little more when we talk about nuclear stockpile sites in general. But what that area um, actually is, is the vaults where the actual nuclear pits were stored. 
At the time, nuclear weapons were stored, basically disassembled, um, with the pit and the initiator removed. So the main body of the weapon would be stored elsewhere, say in those Type D bunkers. And then the nuclear pit would be stored uh, in this A structure, which consisted of a number of small rooms, which were protected by uh, bank vault doors. Um, it's, it's the kind of situation where there are two combination locks. You need two different people, each of which you know is one combination. Behind each of those vault doors would be a series of metal cubbies, which contained what were called bird cages. Now, a bird cage was a sealed metal chamber uh, with uh, pressurized air inside of it in order to keep out any sort of moisture intrusion uh, and sealed with a, a melted lead seal. Uh, they called it a bird cage because that sealed vessel, which is what contained the actual nuclear pit, was surrounded by a metal frame that made it a bit bigger. The purpose of that metal frame was to avoid a criticality accident. Uh, the metal frame that extended out from each of the actual vessels made it so that it wasn't possible to place them close enough together uh, that they could become critical on their own. They were normally stored inside of these vaults, and uh, the operating practice of the time was to place a pit in a weapon only when that weapon was ready for use. Uh, and as a result, there were alert crews who were available at the National Stockpile sites at all times in order to start rapidly assembling nuclear weapons uh, should an order come about to actually use them. Monzano Base, of course, uh, is conveniently close to Kirtland Air Force Base, which provided a ready ability to transport those weapons. However, it's important to note that the nuclear weapons would have been used by the Strategic Air Command, and the Strategic Air Command uh, at the time did not have a wing at Kirtland Air Force Base. So for that reason, Monzano Base is uh, one of, of what we would call a main stockpile site. It is not an operational stockpile site. What that means is that the nuclear weapons stored at Monzano Base were not necessarily intended for rapid use in an emergency. Um, there were a number of other operational stockpile sites which were located immediately adjacent to SAC bases, and those are the weapons which would have been loaded onto an aircraft on short notice. That said, there was a plan that SAC bombers located at air bases which did not have an operational uh, stockpile site because there were not that many of them could actually fly to facilities like Kirtland Air Force Base in order to pick up nuclear weapons uh, and then to leave on bombing missions. As you can imagine, that would have taken quite a long time. And even prior to the ICBM, it was not viewed as a particularly practical method of reprisal. Um, in general, ICBMs obsoleted a large portion of the uh, SAC-style preparation for nuclear war, but especially the development of the ICBM is a major reason that these national stockpile sites fell out of use. Uh, the idea of having a crew of people scramble to assemble a weapon and then rush it out to load it onto an airplane was just not compatible uh, with ICBM-type warfare in which the period of time that you would have to launch a nuclear reprisal would be only 10 to 15 minutes. Now, as I mentioned, Monzano Base was an independent facility until the 1970s. Uh, in 1971, Sandia Base was merged with Kirtland Air Force Base to make it all Kirtland Air Force Base. And at the same time, Monzano Base was merged into the combined facility. So from that time forward, Monzano Base became less and less independent as most of its support services uh, came to be provided by Kirtland Air Force Base. Um, that change in the early 70s was sort of the beginning of the end for Monzano Base. Um, many of the Monzano Base support facilities um, ceased being maintained, and a lot of it got into worse and worse repair, um, with the exception of the active nuclear storage sites. Monzano Base was entirely uh, shut down as a national stockpile site facility, uh, I believe, in 1992. In 1994, the Kirtland Underground Munitions Storage Complex opened uh, at Kirtland Air Force Base. It is located just a little bit further um, to the east, or sorry, to the west, right here. Uh, and it is a, a much more modern, uh, more compact facility, which met the storage need. So Monzano Base was entirely decommissioned. Now, that doesn't mean that Monzano Base has been abandoned, and I think at the end of the second part, we'll talk a little more about how Monzano Base is being used today. Today, there are no longer nuclear weapons stored there. 
There is still some nuclear material stored at Manzano Base, but it's generally either mixed waste, which is awaiting its final disposal, or it's sort of miscellaneous bits and bobs, which are in long-term storage in case Sandia National Laboratory should need them again. Uh, Sandia National Laboratories currently holds a Hazardous Waste Act permit to use um, five to seven of the bunkers at Manzano Base for the storage of nuclear material, and that is largely the extent of the proper nuclear activity at the facility. So let's just take a quick look at what we can find at Manzano Base today uh, through the eyes of Google Earth. Um, obviously, the security perimeter is still largely intact. I'm going to intentionally sort of ignore some of the facilities there um, which are in modern use. We'll cover those a little bit later, but I did want to point out uh, the historic nuclear facilities. Here on the east side, we can see a row of those Type C bunkers. These look more or less like any military ammunition storage area. Um, they consist of earth piled over a concrete structure. But if we look more on the west side of the facility, we'll find something which is a little more unique to Manzano Base. And these are those Type D bunkers, which you can see are a cutout entrance, but then there's actually a tunnel which proceeds quite a ways deeper into the mountain where the actual vault is located. On the north end of the west side, we can find one, if I can find it, of the underground shops that I mentioned. We have an entrance here, an entrance here, as well as those ventilation structures. That is plant number two. Plant number one is located more or less on the opposite side of the mountain facing southeast. We can see the entrances, and we can see a ventilation structure. Now, I read a story online from a veteran who'd worked in one of these facilities that uh, the entrance points to those underground plants were very well hardened with some very thick uh, blast doors. But in the case of an active attempt to invade the facility, those air vents were actually viewed as the major weakness. So they used to run drills where the personnel who manned the facilities would all have to, you know, grab a rifle and then climb up the hill to take defensive positions around those air vents in order to defend them against a, a supposed intruder. Also located at Manzano Base, uh, back on the west side, is I believe this is either plant number three or plant number four. This is one of the two that were built later on. And when I make a video later on about the national stockpile sites in general, this will look very familiar to you. Uh, this was actually sort of a template for the style of plant which was built at many of the other national stockpile sites. This is a covered earth type bunker, so it's a concrete structure with earth piled on top of it. Um, it, it looks quite a bit different. It is less effectively hardened, but it was viewed as good enough. And not only was it cheaper to build, uh, they were a lot more flexible in terms of siting. Of course, to bore into the side of a mountain, you basically need a mountain, and there wasn't one conveniently available at all of the stockpile sites. So most of the later stockpile sites, including the operational stockpile sites uh, located at Air Force bases, uh, have this style of shop instead of shops which are bored uh, into the earth. As we look down this west side, we've had, which had most of the support facilities, many of these warehouses and workshops that you see are actually uh, original to the nuclear stockpile site. Another interesting facility at the Manzano base is this one. Now, I'm not entirely sure that I have the right building here, but I do believe this is Manzano base's example of an S structure. The S was for surveillance, and that was more in the sense of quality surveillance than security surveillance. The S structure was basically a quality assurance laboratory added to the national stockpile sites afterwards, which was staffed by personnel from Sandia National Laboratories who had performed quality checks and inspections on the weapons to ensure that they were being maintained in good order. Now, before we move on to the environmental contamination and remediation story about Manzano Base, I just wanted to share one extra thing that I found uh, recently about the facility. I'm not completely convinced that this is correct, but there are several different websites that report that Manzano Base was also intended as a presidential relocation facility for President Eisenhower, and that there was, at the time of its initial construction, some bunker which had been outfitted as an emergency alternate command center for the National Command Authority. 
Now, I'm having a very hard time finding any uh, really reliable confirmation of that fact, and several of the sources uh, that report that say that it was never really uh, seriously used for that purpose, and that pretty quickly the bunker was converted uh, just to normal storage use like the others. So I'm, I don't quite want to share that as fact, but it's certainly an interesting possibility, and it's something that I'm going to keep digging into to see if I can find uh, any confirmation of that fact. Well, I think I'm going to call that uh, done for part one of this video. Hopefully you learned a, a little bit about the history of Manzano Base. It's a really interesting topic and one that I could go on about for a long time. I think I will, but I think I'll do that in the form of probably a few videos which are more specifically about the National Stockpile Sites. And there we'll go a little more in depth on the construction and design of Manzano Base, as well as how it differs from the 12 other contiguous United States uh, stockpile sites, including the other main sites such as Colleen Base and the operational stockpile sites, uh, such as the one at Travis Air Force Base in California. So keep an eye out uh, shortly for part two of this video where we're really going to get into the environmental aspects.